Um, the first week, we looked at um, the foundation for financial health. And uh, the essence of that was we need to make and understand, should I say, that God is the owner of everything. Now, it's a simple concept, but it is probably one of the most difficult concepts to fully go from the head to the heart, to actually um, do something about it. Um, it's one of those things that probably um, ought to be something that maybe we, we do something in writing, uh, make a covenant or something like that, that actually to say to God, on this day, I acknowledge and I make sure that everything that I have that comes into my possession belongs to you. And that acknowledgement, so that, for example, if you bump your car, you realize, well, it's not my car. You're quite chilled about it, aren't you, if it's not your car? No, <laughs> you see what I mean? You haven't got it yet, have you? So you've got to ca catch that. Everything, that is a foundation upon which our finances lay. Last month, we, uh, sorry, last week, we looked at the whole aspect of contentment, and we talked about you can live in one of two tents, contentment or discontentment, yes? So you're going to be one or the other. And, um, and so we talked about that and, uh, and the, the aspects that, that come to that that make a, a difference for us. And so it's important that we really do understand that if we can live content, it will sort out our financial situation. For the simple reason, we're not going to be hankering after more, after more, after more. Because some people, that it doesn't matter how much that they get, they always want more. And so there's never going to be satisfied. So the question is, what do you need to have in your life for you to be satisfied? And I think it's an important situation, yes? Because we can go to all sorts of financial advisors and all sorts of uh, people that can really give you some wise advice on, on what to do and how to save or how to invest. But if you haven't got these basic foundations in place, that whatever advice they give isn't worth listening to. For the simple reason, you're never going to be happy. So even if they take you and you give them 10 pound and they bring that into a million pounds, that you're not going to be satisfied because it's an internal heart job. So if you have a million, then you'll want the investor to make it to two million and, and vice versa. So it is a, an internal heart aspect to it. We have got to learn the secret of being content. And it's something that we have to learn. Now, a couple of things <clears throat> um, is that, uh, that there are some great books, and uh, there's one that's called The Blessed Life by Robert Morris. And uh, a number of years ago, we actually did a series. We put uh, Robert uh, on the big screen throughout the summer, and we listened to him teach on it, and then uh, we looked at it in our small groups, and there is a book on it. Um, if you want to hear someone talk about finances that's inspiring, listen to this guy. This guy is in a league of his own when he talks about finances. He is absolutely amazing, yes? And uh, I certainly can't do justice to it, but you can go online and uh, to the Gateway Church, if you just put Robert Morris in, and uh, the Blessed Life, you'll be able to go onto his site, and they actually have the Blessed Life series, and you can watch the videos and, uh, of him teaching and uh, get a hold of the book. Amen? It really would do you, do you well. Uh, if you want to invest in yourself and you want to, to go over this, I'm going to say to you, it will change your life if you can just grasp this more than anything else. Finances is the very core of everything that we do. Um, so it's thing. And then another book uh, called Your Money Counts by Mark Lloydbottom. I can't see having a name like that, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> but uh, he's actually um, works for uh, Crown Ministries, Crown Financial Ministries, and, uh, which is originally an American one, but he uh, operates in the UK. And uh, much of what I, I, I say will come from this book. It's a fantastic book. Um, and uh, it's something, again, to take away with you, to, to read. And, um, and again, we're doing the CAP course 
But uh, another course that is absolutely brilliant, we will probably do um, at some point in the future, is this uh, Crown Financial course. Uh, it, it, it is great. So I thought I'd just give you a plug uh, for, the, for those, just if for those of you that want to invest in yourself, if you don't want to invest in yourself, then of course, don't worry about it. I don't think about it. Don't buy the books, just kind of mosey on through life as you are. Now, I don't know if you've heard about the guy that was in hospital. And he was really sick. And uh, his family learned that he had just inherited a million pounds. But the family thought, if we give him this, this news, it might just, it might shock his heart and, uh, and we don't want anything serious to happen. So what, we th what they decided to do was to go call the pastor and said to the pastor, would you gently let him know? So the pastor went along to the hospital bed and talked to the man and said to him, he says, well, <clears throat> what would you do if, just, just imagine if for a moment you were to win a million pounds, what would you do with it? And the man, without even flinching, said, well, I would give half of it to the church. At which point, the pastor died. <laughs> <laughs> died of heart attack. He was so surprised. God is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. He's not a God who does things by chance. He doesn't do things flippantly. He has a reason. He has principles that he puts into place. He puts laws into place for you and for me to follow that if we follow those laws, we will have God's blessing on our life, on our family, on our ministries, on our church. You only have to look at the universe and look at the, the uh, God who has things arranged in order. Yes, everything is in systems, the solar system, our systems of our bodies, the biological system. Yes, every aspect of us, our neurological system. You know, uh, uh, well, we won't go through all of them, but, uh, but with all those kind of things. In fact, God is so much into, into detail that in actual fact, when you look at the solar system and the way that it's set up, for example, our Earth uh, is revolving and it is set on an axis it's on a little tilt and it's just at the correct tilt because if it was one degree uh, uh, one way we would, uh, we would all freeze up if it was one degree the other way we would all burn up isn't that amazing that God could get the accuracy of the right tilt for earth and, and so often you know we don't understand this and one of the things I'll uh, if I remember talk about later is, uh, is that the earth is spinning well, the law of logic of, 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 of the thing is, if anything's spinning, anything in that actually gets repelled, doesn't it? But in actual fact, when you look at, uh, at God's law of uh, the earth is spinning and yet things are attracted to it, the law of magnetism. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad about the law of magnetism. I'm glad that it was, I don't understand it, but let's just say I, 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 I'm quite happy with it, Yes. So, for example, you know, we, we call it gravity, don't we? And so with gravity, I'm glad that it works every day of the week, 24-7. So it didn't like on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's a non-gravity day. Can you imagine that? And so God is a God of order. God has laws in place and principles in place. And I want us to, to look at that this morning. And it's a big subject. And normally I take four or five weeks just on this so you can understand if you don't get out of here for lunch. Or maybe tea time, I don't know. We'll see how we go. But I want you to know that unless, even though you might not understand the principles, you don't need to understand the principles to apply them. So for example, I don't understand electricity and how that works fully. I'm not sure anybody does, but anyway. But, but we, we understand it, but then... It doesn't stop me flicking a switch to turn a light on. In other words, I still apply the laws of electricity, some ways in ignorance, but I understand that if I flick that switch, the light comes on. I don't argue about it. I don't think, no, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. But because we have, been, but until you flick that switch, nothing happens. 
So you can say, I believe that there's electricity behind there and that when I flick that switch, it's going to come on. But if you don't, so what I'm saying to you with the, the laws of God, with the principles in the Word of God, you have to apply them. You have to try them. You have to work them out. You have to do something about them. It's no good just saying, I believe that God owns everything and then live as if he doesn't. Do you get what I'm trying to say? I know I should live contented with what I've got, but... And then, of course, we live differently. And so we've got to, to do that. Now, talking about finances, I just want to say the first thing I want to say is we are not a prosperity gospel church. In other words, we don't believe that everybody should be riding around in a Ferrari or a Mercedes and be a millionaire. We don't believe that. And if you look at the, at the Bible, you look at what Jesus said, it's clearly not right. But on the other hand, there are some people who are into the poverty gospel uh, at church. We're not into that neither. We don't believe that being poor makes you more righteous. And some people think that. Some people think that if you go around and you really get rid of everything that you've got and you can't really be saved until you've got rid of everything. We're not that. Scripture, uh, it's like the balance between the two. Scripture is clear about the way that we need to go with this. Because God has put laws into place that if we operate them, whether they're laws of spending, investing, um, you know, the, the, the things that we do, managing and insuring and giving of our finances, we will find that, uh, that, that God works through these. And so we have got to learn this. So this week, I want us to learn to be farmers. I want you to think to yourself that you are a farmer going out to have a crop. You want to harvest. You want to see something in your life you want to harvest. You want to harvest uh, in your family. You want to harvest in your finances. You want to have a harvest uh, in your relationships. You want to have a harvest in any area with your health, whatever it might be, that you're looking for God to bless you. Well, you've got to learn the principle of being a farmer. And because a farmer understands these principles, even if he doesn't think God created the principles, every farmer operates from, uh, uh, from, from this principle. And, um, and Proverbs 11 verse 18 says this. <clears throat> it says, The wicked man earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness will be certain to reap a reward. It's obviously a, a, a verse about Money. Yes, he's talking about our income. He's talking about the way that we make money. If we make it dishonestly or whether we make it honestly, it is important to us. Yes? And so he's talking about sowing. We've got to sow righteousness. We've got to sow some good things in our life if we want to reap some good things in our life. Now, the way that the farmers used to farm and to sow the seed... Um, for, for most of uh, the history of the earth has been in a very different way to where they are now. And to, today, often the machines will go along and they'll kind of dig a little hole, the machine digs it, puts a seed in, drops it. You know, I mean, it's kind of like uh, unbelievable the way they do it. But in them days, they used to just have a, have a like a basket or a bucket or whatever it might be, and they would have it and they would just throw seed like that. So they would just walk and throw seed. So the seed was scattered. The seed was broadcast is the term that's used. That's why we get TV broadcast, anything that is spread out. Um, and, and so we, we broadcast through that. And so we've got to understand that when we're sowing, God wants us to be multiple sowers, to sow many, many seeds uh, in the ground. And so the first point I want to make is this, is that everything starts with a seed. Every idea is a seed, every dream is a seed, uh, every achievement we have and the things that we do and the things that we say are seeds that we do. And we've got to understand life began as a seed for every one of us, yes? And so everything on this planet starts with a seed. God created the world and, um, and he, Genesis 1 verse 11 says, Let the land have seed-bearing plants and trees that bear fruit with seed in it, according to to their varieties. <clears throat> There's the old cliche that says you can count the amount of seeds in an apple, but you can't count the amount of apples that are in a seed. Because in every seed, there is immense potential, isn't there? A seed has exponential potential. 
You can take one seed, plant it in the ground, it grows, and it produces something greater than what it originally was. And that's why Zephaniah says, do not despise the day of small things. Because it's in the day of small things that things are birthed and things grow and things develop. And that's, that's where the change happens. That's where Satan is after you in your life at the seed level. Because once it's germinated, he can't do a lot about it. Once it's rooted in your life, but if he can get you at the seed level, if he can get you at that point of that giving, then he has got you. And so we've got to understand that. Now, <clears throat> one of the trees... Um, called a redwood tree, I don't know if you know this, but is the largest living thing on planet Earth. It's, uh, it's greater than the whales and anything else. Now. It is absolutely enormous. The largest one in Calif California is 84 meters high. Well, if you think of this room here, there's, you're looking at probably about six meters. So if you're thinking of something that's 84 meters high, well, we're not seeing the top of that, but that's. Uh, but you can see that, and 11.1 meters wide. It's obviously growing because the first time I, I read about it, it was only nine meters and odd. But, but can you see that? It can even drive a car through the tree. That's how big it is. That's how awesome it is. And how did that start? It started as a right little tiny seed. It's a very small seed. That's the potential. Now, some of these things can last and they can live for thousands of years. They're known for, I think one's, they're known to be about 2,100 years old. Nearly as old as I am. So they can really, really kind of grow. Now, of course, some redwood tree, can you, can you imagine? In other words, their base is bigger than this stage. Yeah? The, the width of, the width of, of that, that part is 15. This is probably about 10, 10, 10 meters. So in other words, that's the width of the tree. It's enormous, isn't it? Yes. But the, the, the seed is dinky. It's like um, a speck of sand uh, or a pepper. And Job 8 verse 7 says, Though what you start will seem small and insignificant, you'll end up in the future with much. That's what God promises us. He says you might not be able to see where he's going now. But God understands that when he births something and he's behind it, that it's his exponential factor that's involved, isn't it? It's, it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing of what God will do. Secondly, a seed has to be planted. Nothing happens in life until the seed is planted. You can keep it on the shelf for as long as you want, and it will not do anything. It will not develop, will not grow. In other words, you keep your seed in your bank. It's not going to do anything. It's just going to stay there, um, unless somebody's adding some interest to it, of course. And we hope it's compound interest. If you're getting some compound, you know what compound is? It means it's pounded. Really? No, but compound interest, that's, this is another throwaway. Compound interest is one of the great marvels uh, that we have. So in other words, you start small and you might have a hundred pound and then you get a little bit of interest on that. You might, let's say you get 10% interest on that, you get another tenner. The year after that, if you get 10% on it, you're getting, not getting 10% on a hundred pound, you're getting 10% on 110 pound. And so it actually eventually becomes into like a J curve. So it starts small, doesn't seem a lot is happening, but if you keep on being faithful in the small things... It becomes exponential. And God is saying, if you will be faithful in the small things, I will give you the big things. It will become big. It will become and it will grow. So we've got to be that kind of thing. We've got to be a farmer. Now, the thing with the farmer, he has to plant it, doesn't he? There's no point a farmer going, I'm broke. Yeah? And complaining to the soil and complaining to God or praying about it. He needs to go out and sow some seed, doesn't he? But if he goes and plants some seed, then guess what? So every farmer, you don't have to be a believer, understands that if, he, that if he wants a harvest, he has to plant a seed. And so you and I have got to learn to plant some seeds in our life. John 12, verse 24, Jesus explained this principle to his disciples. 
and particularly was talking about the aspect of why he came to die on the cross. And he said this, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, it cannot reproduce. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, and of course he's talking about his own death here, it cannot reproduce. But if it dies, it will produce much fruit. I want to tell you, through that one seed, through Jesus giving his life, that one seed's death, I want to say to you, billions of people will be in heaven as a result of that one seed. In other words, it's exponential. That's, that's, that's the Jesus that we, so that's the God that we have. And he's saying, I want to be involved in your life and I want you to plant some seeds. In other words, if you have a need, plant a seed. What needs do you have? Wherever that need is, plant the seed. Thirdly, we reap the same in nature to what we sow. Yes? Genesis 1.11 says, God ordered everything to produce after its kind. Jesus, when he was speaking to Nicodemus, uh, John 3 uh, says this, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is Spirit, yes, flesh produces flesh, spirit produces spiritual things, yes. So if you have your mind on the things of the flesh, on, the, on things that are carnal, guess what you're going to do? You're going to produce, uh, the only thing you can produce ultimately is death. But if you're on the things of the spirit and you're thinking about the things of the spirit and you're planting seeds in your mind and in other people's lives that are spiritual seed, it is going to produce life. It is going to produce righteousness. Isn't that fantastic? <clears throat> so we have got to understand that, that we're going to get the same. In other words, if you, plant, if you plant tomatoes, you're not going to get pears. Yes? Now, we understand this, don't we? But it's amazing how many people think that all through the week they can be sowing to the flesh, sowing to their own things, doing other things, and then someday they want crop failure. And they're hoping that none of that will actually be, be, be harvested, but suddenly I'm in the house of God and I'm going to get some harvest. I want to say to you, it's what you do on Monday that's going to affect your Sunday. It's the little things that you're doing and you've got to start planting, becoming a father, farmer. So every moment of every day, you walk around going, Farmer Harris is here today. Farmer's here. And, so, and thinking, now, where can I plant some seeds? Where can I plant some things that I'm going to reproduce what I want to, to see reproduced? What is it that I want God to bless? There are some things God's not going to bless. And it doesn't matter... <laughs> What are you doing? How are you doing? In other words, when you get angry, God's not going to bless you when you're angry. Are you sowing seeds of anger? Are you sowing seeds of peace? Are you sowing seeds of impatience or patience? What are the seeds that you're sowing? Because it is absolutely imperative that we do this. Galatians 6 and verse 7 says this, Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. You will reap exactly what you plant. In other words, whatever you dish out is coming back to you. So if you want to be loved, guess what you've got to give out? If you want people to be generous with you, what have you got to be? Do you see what I'm trying to say? You think about your life and think, what do I want to be? And God will say, well, then you be that to others and you will reap a harvest. Because the world of a generous man expands and increases all the time. So if you go out and show grace and mercy, what are you going to get back? If you go out and you forgive others, what are you going to get back? I don't know about you, but I love to be, getting, to be forgiven. I don't like when people hold a grudge, you know what I'm trying to say? And so it's important for us to do that. But it's, it, it works on both the negative and the positive. In other words, if you sow negative, sinful things, guess what you're going to reap? Yeah, we all understand that, don't we? We're going to reap what we've put in. It's like gossip. It's so easy. And the, what the problem is, is we think, oh, it's just one little gossip. But when you gossip, what you are doing is, you're getting in the chain of all the gossip. And, all, and you gossip about one person, and if anybody does gossip to you about somebody, uh, somebody else, you need to know that they're going to say that about you. They're going to gossip about you. Yeah, 
you know, we, we, get, we get hooked into this thing. Oh, they're just telling us. It's a matter of prayer. And then proceed that they can tell you whatever they want to tell. I want to say to you, we need to be careful about what we say. Because we're in the, gossip is one of those things. It's, it's like, gossip is like, um, you know, you, you've, uh, you, you go to, I remember reading the illustration. It's like you go and uh, you might put a feather on, uh, on, on, you know, in someone's life. That feather is not going to stay there, is it? It's going, to, it's going to disappear. It's going to move. In other words, you can't ever go back on that. You might get forgiven, but there are consequences to what we do. Amen? So we've got to be there. You've gone quiet now. It's okay. Uh, I'm going to preach until you're all standing on your chairs. Going, God, make my seed grow. Amen? So don't gossip. That's how that Proverbs 26 and verse 27 says, He who digs a pit, in other words, to hurt others, will fall into it himself. He who rolls a stone will have it rolled back on him. In other words, what goes around comes around, <laughs> absolutely. Whatever you give out comes back. Hosea 10 says this, You planted wickedness and now you have reaped evil. Yes? So we've got to understand this, that if we... So irresponsibility, we're not going to reap success in life. If we sow laziness, we're not going to reap a productive, uh, fruitful life. You can't sow stinginess in life and expect people to be generous with you. Yeah? And we see this illustrated in the life of Jacob. In the life of Jacob, Jacob and his mom schemed uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with his father, Isaac, uh, into Isaac giving Jacob the firstborn son's blessing, which was due to Isaac, yes? And this I want to say to you, after this, yes, he got the blessing, he got the firstborn's blessing, but the price of it, because he did it in a wrong way, the price was that he had to run for his life and his mother paid the price that she never, ever saw her son again. She died before he ever returned. That's the last time Rebecca would see her son. And then Jacob, of course, was deceived. He was deceived by Laban into marrying Leah instead of Rachel. Um, and so he, he, he'd worked seven years to marry Rachel. Can you imagine that, guys? You've worked seven years. The father-in-law has said, okay, you can have my daughter. It's a little bit like, put it like this way. I hope I don't offend Faith. But anyway, uh, should have checked before on, but anyway, here we go. It's like Nadine and Faith. Nadine's my youngest daughter, yes? And Faith is my eldest daughter. So it's a little bit like this. It's like a guy comes along and he's madly in love with Nadine. And then I said to him, okay, you can have uh, Nadine's handy marriage, but you've got to work for me for seven years. You've got to be in the youth ministry for seven years. For seven years, you work free full time. Yeah. So, so, but I'll pay your wages. Not a lot, okay? But, uh, but, but, but you can stay and stay with us. And then after seven years, it comes to the great marriage. We have a big, big thing and we're all getting married. And then, guess what? I give him faith. What do you think the guy's going to say? <laughs> Some of the guys going, oh, that wouldn't be so bad. But anyway, but, but, but so, the, so he's worked because he's not in love with Rachel. He's in love with Leah. No, sorry, he's not. He's in love with Rachel, not Leah. I'll get it the right way around. Um, basic Bible study and I'll still get it wrong. Um, but, but all I'm saying is, can you imagine that? So then Laban says to him, you've got another if you want Rachel, you've got to work another seven years now in the kids' work. Do you know what I'm trying to say? That's, that's what, that's what um, was, was in that. And so we've got to understand that, that Jacob deceived, but he was then deceived. And as he deceived with an animal skin, he was with an animal skin that he was deceived himself when Jacob's own sons schemed against him and they put Joseph, which he had this coat made of many colours, and they put him in to, um, to, to a pit and they sold him into slavery and they told Jacob and they said to him, some animal, and they brought an animal skin, has devoured him. 
He put on clothes to deceive and then clothes were used to deceive him. In other words, whatever you sow, you are going to reap. It is God's law of the harvest. So what kind of a farmer do you want to be? I could go through the whole Bible because it's one after the other. But one that I really like particularly, I think sells this out really great, is the story of Esther. Now, some of you, once I mention this, you're there, right? You've already got where I'm going. But actually, Esther was a Jew. And, uh, and Mordecai, she lived with a, she was a, a, an, a, like an asylum seeker. She was living abroad. She's living with, a, with her uncle Mordecai. And then this guy, Haman, hates the Jews. And so, long story short, he sorts it out. That, uh, that, that it arranges it so that all the Jews are going to be kind of killed at some point in the, uh, in the future. And what he does, though, out of excitement of try getting Mordecai, he builds some gallows to put Mordecai on. So cut a long story, guess. Short, guess who ends up on the gallows that Haman had for Mordecai? Haman. So you've got to be careful, haven't we? You want to get revenge? You want to get even? I want to tell you, there is a price to be had for it. I kind of say to you, one of the things is, we sow most of our time so often into our children. You, all you need to do is to look at your children and they are a reflection of who you are. Reflection in the physical realm, but also a reflection in the spiritual realm. Where are your children spiritually is what have you sown? And I love this, that was written by Dorothy Law Nolte. It says this, if a child lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, he learns to fight. If a child lives with ridicule, he learns to be shy. If a child lives with shame, he learns to feel guilty. If a child lives with tolerance, he learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, he learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, he learns to appreciate. If a child lives with fairness, he learns justice. If a child lives with security, he learns to have faith. If a child lives with approval, he learns to like himself. If a child lives with acceptance and friendship, he learns to find love in the world. Actions speak louder than words. We need to know what we're sowing. And I'm sure many of you heard, sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character and reap a destiny. Everything starts with a seed, but a seed has to be planted and we reap what we sow. But a fourth one, which I think is quite important here, is to realize that we actually reap what others have sown. Because we can get so much about what we do, and we, we can only control what we sow, but we do need to understand that actually we often reap some of the things that other people have sown. And some of that's good and some of that's bad. So, for example, like we are in this building because other people have sown into it. And we get the privilege of that, yes? When we came here and you drove a car here, maybe, then if you drove the car, you didn't design the car, you didn't create the car, you didn't even get the oil out of the thing to put it into your, you know, and, and convert it to fuel um, and to, to get here, that you are reaping what others have done. The roads, we didn't, I didn't lay any, other, any roads, but I use the roads. I reap from what other people have sown. And we do that whether it's good or for bad. Yes, so the people, for example, in Ukraine are reaping what the Russians are sowing. And some of the stuff in there is up, it's, it's horrendous. Uh, I mean, some of it is just, is just beyond, uh, beyond words, some of the atrocities that are going on. And, uh, and, and um, I was talking to someone, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Bill Wilson, uh, in America does a great kids' work. Um, well, he was visiting with a pastor that I was with on Friday night, and they were sharing some of the, the things that are going on. I want to say to you, it's horrendous that most of this stuff does not come out in the, in the news. There's very little coming out. The torture, the horrendous things that are happening to some of the Ukraines is, is beyond, uh, beyond, and certainly don't want to uh, talk about it and, and bring out the stuff now. But I want you to know that with freedom that we have here today is because other people have sown with their lives. 
Some people have given their lives for our freedom. And we can, we can so easily take it for granted. But we need to understand that God's looking for us to sow so that others can reap. And we can sow into a new generation and to see that reap. Are you willing to give your life so that it can be buried? So that it can die and rise again and become so much more fruitful? I believe that is what God is wanting for us to do. Fifthly, we reap in a different season than when we sow, yes? In other words, the moment we sow is not the moment we reap. There is a time difference. There is a season for sowing and then there is a season for reaping. In other words, plants take time to grow, yes? Maturity doesn't come overnight. It is developed. It is grown. And uh, there's no such thing as instant maturity as much as we would like to do that. So in other words, no farmer goes out and plants some seeds and goes off and plants seeds and then has a cup of, goes home, has a cup of tea and comes out and goes, where's the harvest? Because he understands that he's going to do that. So for example, different plants um, develop at different rates, don't they? Not everything does that. So if you've got a fruit tree, so for example, we have an apple tree and we have a plum tree. So when the plums start to come, if we just leave them, then they come in the masses. But actually, they're all developing and ripening at different, at different stages. So you're able to, to take some and, and enjoy those, and then they keep getting ripe. And, and, and you do. So that's the, that's the same thing, is that God has, has a season, and it's his timing. And we've got to acknowledge that God knows the right time for the harvest, the right time when you're going to do that. I know, I know a pastor that, uh, that, that actually he was, he'd saved for his vacation, and uh, he'd got the, got the money all ready for his holidays. And then he got a phone call from somebody who said to him, um, who was explaining that they were looking to, um, and he knew about it, they were, they were wanting to adopt a child. Um, but the whole process of them adopting the child was going to take a long, long time. But, uh, but, but suddenly things had changed and they were going to get this child very quickly, but they didn't have the money for it. So they were just talking to this pastor about it. And this pastor realized, and he was... Uh, his wife was over in it, and then straight away he says to us, I'll give you the money so that you can have that child. So he gave it straight away. Now, <clears throat> there was an agreement there, and he said to him, says, I'm not loaning you the money, I'm giving you the money. Can you imagine that? So that's his holiday out the window. But actually, he'd hardly put the phone down when someone else phoned him up and said, oh, pastor, by the way, I don't know why, but God's just put you on my heart, and, uh, and I've got this holiday home, and um, I'm not going to be using it. If you want to use it, you can, you can go there and use it to your heart content, you know, for, for, for a week, any time you want. So he went. And I'll tell you what he was saying is, for the next 12 years, the family enjoyed that holiday home. That's multiplication. He didn't give it thinking, oh, well, I'm going to get, God's going to give me another holiday home and I'm going to be, the... he didn't do that. You just give it, you get the seed. And God's time, God's way he will always ensure that it comes back to you. Amen? I believe it's important. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 uh, says this, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. And this passage of Scripture was made famous, particularly by the pop band in the 1965 called The Birds. Yeah, they were. Now, I wonder how many of you were, <laughs> were born in 1965, yes? I was three. So, of course, for me, it was the band. No, okay. Um, <clears throat> but they made it famous. I was going to play it, but because of copyright reasons, uh, we won't be able to do it. So when you go home, you'll be able to listen to Scripture sung by a, a pop band if you want to do. <clears throat> but they, they, in other words, they were singing something that actually, thousands of years ago, Solomon was teaching. And it's so important, isn't it, that we need to know. There is a time to plant, and there's a time for harvest. There's a time to scatter. There's a time to gather. There's a time to sow, and there's a time to reap. My question is, is will you put these into practice? Because if you will, it will pay dividends. You will always reap more than you have sown. That's the principle of 
the harvest. That's the principle of you, you would not sow a seed. No farmer would sow a seed if he thought he was just going to get back exactly what he put in. He knows he's going to get a massive um, um, proportion back in, com- in comparison to what he's given. And Mark 4 and verse 8, Jesus giving a parable of the, of the types of soil that the seed's put into. It's the same seed, but the soil, and that, I, it represents our heart, the soil of our heart. When I'm talking to you this morning, when I talk to you each week, I want to say to you, the seed that goes out, it's down to the receptivity of your heart. And the receptivity of your heart, if you've got hard heart, if you've got hard soil, the seed's not going to germinate, it's not going to grow, it's not going to hold. It can just be brushed away very easily. But this is what he said, some seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, and 100 times. Now that's some kind of percentage, isn't it? That's not 30%, yes, yes. That's 30 times what you put in, yes? So if you, in other words, it's like I said, if you, if you put a seed in worth 100 pound, yes, you're going to get 30 times 100, which is what? For all the mathematicians, it's not three quid, is it? So you've got to understand that that's God's interest rate when we give to God, And not only that, we reap in proportion to how much we sow. So in other words, if you sow a little, you reap a little. If you sow a lot, you reap a lot. Yes, it's true in giving. It's true when we tithe. It's true when we give offerings. It's true when we put our energy into something, when we're serving in a ministry. It's so true to us. 2 Corinthians 9 says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, but for God loves a cheerful giver. So in other words, if you feel pressured to give because I or anyone else, particularly TV evangelists, then you feel I have got to give because of that, I want to say to you, don't give. It's the wrong thing. Your motive must be right. Your heart must be right because God doesn't need your money. You've got to understand, God doesn't need money, but he wants what it represents. And when we give our tithe, it's representing the first of everything. It's the first, it's the best, it's it's everything. And, uh, and, And I just think to myself, how God blesses when you just put him first. Amen. So I believe we've got to do that. We've got to give cheerfully. Funnily enough, I heard one time that the, the, the Greek word behind this word cheerful is the word hilarious, which, of course, we get the word hilarious. In other words, you've got, to, you've got to give until you feel good about it. It's amazing how many times people say, oh, uh, if, I, if I give that much, I wouldn't feel too good. But giving is important to us. And it's important for so many different reasons. You know, like we do in the shoebox, and I'll, I'll kind of finish with this. I don't know about you, but I've heard so many stories of people that have sacrificed for others. And how it moves you, the emotion behind some of the things when somebody has given. You know, like these shoeboxes, and when you l- listen to some of the stories of the children and what they've received, and... And, and when people have given things and, and uh, the way that that has changed them because they have given. I want to say to you, I've never heard an emotional keeper's story. I've never heard or been moved by anybody that said to me, you know, I thought about doing a shoebox and I thought about just blessing a child. I thought about just being able to, to kind of bless that child at Christmas. But I got over it and I thought, no, I'm glad I didn't do that. I'm glad I just kept it to myself and sh- that child didn't have a Christmas. I don't, that I don't know about you, but I don't find that emotionally moving. Do you? But when somebody said to me, and, and you, you know, some you get the children, the children go, use their pocket money to go to say, I, I don't know about you, but that moves me. Giving moves you. Keeping, don't, nobody's interested in your keeping. I've never been moved by the fact that somebody's got £100,000 in their bank account. But if that person, and somebody's given, and you know, like the, Jesus talks about the widow, and somebody just gives that, that's all they've got, that moves me. That's what God is looking for. 
He's looking for a people who will sow what they have because he will give you more. Because God doesn't want to give into a cul-de-sac. He wants to give into a river. He wants to give to people who the, the spirit of God is flowing through and he's flowing out. So he gives to us, gives to us spiritual gifts, gives to us fruit, gives to us maturity, gives us time, gives us all sorts of gifts. And he's saying, I want it to flow through you to others. And if you flow, I'll just keep topping you up. You'll just keep flowing like a river, flowing like a river. It's like having a tap on. You turn that tap off, nothing's coming out. It doesn't matter what's behind there. It's the same. Nothing's going to flow until you turn the tap on. Turn the tap on and allow the things of God to do it. Amen. Let's stand together and let's just give him some praise and worship and honor. Amen. Amen.